Houston. I guess uh, that my memory lapses me many times. I have a good wife that takes care of me, though. Richard White uh, had asked me to come down there and speak in his church, and I was happy to do it for him. He has uh, been there nearly a year now, not quite a year, after his seminary for three years, and he's baptized about 12 people already. So God is blessing him and his ministry down there and his family, so we want to keep him in our prayers. Light of the world, for you are the light of the world, as the title says of the sermon today, you are the light. And uh, there's a humorous story that has been told probably many, many times about two famous people. One would be Jack Nicholson's a golfer. We have any golfers here who play golf? No one? Am I alone? And then there was another uh, uh, distinguished singer, and his name was Stevie Wonder. And as you know, Stevie Wonder plays the piano, but he's also totally blind. And these two men were supposedly got together one day, and, uh, and, uh, and it astounded Nicholas to hear that Wonder, Stevie Wonder was an avid golfer as well. And, uh, well, then, I'll call him Jack, because that's his first name. Jack says, well, how could you possibly play golf when you're blind? Oh, it's not so hard, really, Steve said. I tee up the ball. I have my caddy walk out the distance I usually drive, and I call to him and, uh, from the center of the fairway, where he usually hits. And then I hit the ball in that direction after he goes out, and he calls me from where it lands. And I walk over to the ball, and when he moves further out in the directions I need to hit until he is standing on the center of the green. Then he tells me how far the ball is from the trap and any hazards that are there. And then I hit the ball accordingly. Oh, Jack said, that's amazing. So tell me something. Do you even putt? Oh, yeah, that's easy. The caddy, he gets down on the green, right where the ball is, and then he walks over to, to, the, uh, to the hole where the ball is supposed to drop in, and he tells me how the grass lies and uh, so forth and so on, the pitch of the green. And then he hollers to me from where the hole is, and I hit the ball to where the voice is, and guess what? It drops in. In fact, Stevie said to Jack, he says, I believe, I believe that I could beat you in playing golf, and we should get together. And, and Jack says, no way, no way are you going to beat me in golf. Oh, yeah, I think I can, Stevie said. And, uh, and I think we ought to go out and play around. Playing around is playing a golf course. And, uh, and uh, he asked if Jack Nicklaus was free, and he said, yeah, I'm free. What time can we get together? And Stevie said about 10 o'clock tonight. Now, if you know anything about golf, and I've never played golf at night, but if you know anything about light, that you can at least smile at that one anyway. Golf's not a game that people play at night. Perhaps you have heard this said, in the land of the blind, one eye is king. Well, in the darkness of night, a blind man has a distinct advantage over a sighted person. 
When the darkness of sin sweeps over the world, those who follow God will have a life-saving advantage. They will have spiritual eyesight. Let's pray. Father, Father, as we worship you this morning, I ask, Father, that each, every one of us here will have that spiritual insight. The light that is essential for our daily lives. And Lord, bless us as we worship and listen to your word today. In thy name we pray. Amen. For light is essential for our daily life. No one chooses to walk at night on a strange and unfamiliar path without a source of light. Matter of fact, John 8, verse 12, if you'll turn to the Bible, John 8, verse 12, if you have it there handy for you, I'll read from the King James Version this morning, the New King James, this one. Jesus is saying here that I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have light of life. Jesus said that he provides the light of life. But I doubt any one of us here today would walk in a hazardous path without a flashlight to guide us along the way. I remember one time when my son DJ and I were going down deep in Virginia to hike on a Cranberry Bog Reservation up on top of a mountain somewhere down in Virginia. It was called Cranberry Bog Reservation because the trail was wet. If you know anything about cranberries, they're harvested when they flood the area and the cranberries float to the top. But I didn't see any cranberries plants there in the mountain top, but uh, that's what they called it. And if you hiked on the Appalachian Trail, you have a white trail on the trees. About, I think it's two by six inches on white trail. And, and if the trail makes a turn, there's two of them over top of each other. But in this case, it was a blue marked trail, blue paint on a tree. You can see white better at night than you can blue. So we hiked in for about an hour and a half at dark. We were supposed to meet at 12. We got there at 5. So guess what? There was no one around. So let's go, son. So we started hiking in. We hiked for about two and a half miles, almost two and three-quarter miles, and we didn't see the blue markings anymore. We had to have flashlights. And we must have missed it or we didn't look on the right tree, but that trail turned right there. I said, well, DJ, the only thing we can do is just holler. And we started hollering, and people heard us from the camps, and they came out to meet us. But you must have light. You must have light when you're traveling at night like that in a hazardous trail. You wouldn't neglect to use your car headlights while driving at night, regardless of your faith in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6 says, give us further insight into the light of of Jesus referred to. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, I believe that was our, our um, scripture reading. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If we get nothing else from that text, it is clear that this light that both Jesus and Paul were speaking of is not the literal, but a spiritual light, the spiritual light. But think of it, the power of God that brought light from the darkness at creation is the same power of God that shines into the hearts of God's children today, you and I, all of us. Wonders of wonders. Wow. What have we done to deserve such light? A knowledge of the light and the love of God. What do we done to deserve that? 
we point to nothing but grace. Grace. You've heard the song. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. Yes, you recognize that, I'm sure. It's a hymn called Marvelous Grace. The third verse, however, is not included in our church hymnal. It goes like this. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there's a flowing, a crimson tide, brighter than snow. You may be today. Brighter than snow. Emanating from Jesus, the light of the world. The question is, is who is worthy? Who is worthy of Jesus? Who is worthy of Jesus? He died for us while we're sinners. He came to us in moral darkness. He calls us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Oh, what marvelous grace. Yes. And what should our response be? Notice our verse. It says that this light shined in our hearts. Why? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. When Christ lives in us, my friends, we become the light of the world because what? Christ is in us. And the Lord challenges us saying, no light should be hidden. No light should be hidden. Luke 8, verse 16, the New King James puts it this way. No one who has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel, or puts it under his bed, but sets it on a lamppost that whose who enters may see the light. Those who enter may see the light. You probably heard an illustration, but I'll give you an illustration about this marvelous light. A light that, that this text was talking about, you put on a, on a lamppost. There was a ship on maneuvers, a battleship. Look, he noticed the light was in the darkness. And if you're ever out on the ocean, there's no lights. You can't see anything. But you look far, far away, and you'll see a light in a dark, foggy night. And after nothing, after noting the light um, <clears throat> coordinates, the captain recognized the ship was on a collision course with another vessel. So the captain instructed, signal the ship, we are on a collision course, make your turn 20 degrees. Change your course. And the other person signaled back and countered, and he said, advise for you to change your course 20 degrees. The captain signal said, I am the captain. Change your course 20 degrees. And the response was, I'm, I'm a seaman second class. You better change your course 20 degrees. Now, can you imagine the captain hearing that from a second classman? But by this time, the captain became furious. And his signal curtly ordered, I am a battleship. Change your course 20 degrees. And then the reply came back. He said, I am a lighthouse. You make the call. We have to allow the light of Christ to be steadfast in our life. Shine where he shines and go where he goes. We must be firm like that lighthouse of the world in the world of 2014. It's a very, very dark place. And I may even say this, that this world is even getting darker. Many people are living lives that are contrary to the word of God. 
They feel that there is nothing wrong, nothing wrong with fornication, nothing wrong with adultery, nothing wrong with hatred, nothing wrong with prejudice, nothing wrong with planting bombs, nothing wrong with shooting people, nothing wrong with failing to serve the living God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man, Paul tells us, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Both Jesus and Paul press the fact that a natural, unconverted man loves darkness. Turn to John 3.16. Probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible. Probably one that you learned from when you were a little child coming up. I know I did. Probably one of the first verses. If you go to a large sporting event, <coughs> pardon me, of any kind, it seems inevitable that someone will hold up a banner reminding us of the power of that verse, John 3.16. Open your Bibles because we want to read not only John 3.16, but we want to read further. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have, what? Everlasting life. But if we stick to that verse... And if we stick to a verse-a-day method of study, we miss out on the power of verse 17. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to do what? To condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay? God, too often, is portrayed as an exacting judge, lording over his subjects, but together these verses says that God loves us and sets in motion the most costly plan to help us escape the condemnation and receive salvation. We, we, however, as rebel seed must ultimately be restored to divine harmony and perfection. Otherwise, we find ourselves on the wrong end of the broom in the great cleanup of the call, up called the final judgment. We don't want to be on the wrong end of the broom on the end of the final judgment. Because after the cleansing fire that follows judgment, sin and sinners, guess what? Will be no more. It's a great plan the Lord has. But what does it require of us to be on the upside and not on the downside of this plan? Verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, God. There's only one way only one way to escape the wrath of God against sin, and that is to separate ourselves from it. And the only way we can do that separation is through Jesus. He is the only way. Jesus knew that, and that is why he was willing to redeem mankind through the victorious death. Had there been another way or an easier way, don't you think that the Lord would have chosen it? But in the garden, he asked his father, is there another way? Can I save mankind without taking this cup, bearing their sins, dying their death? And the answer was no. No. So Jesus came and lived. Jesus suffered and died. And if we don't take advantage of the only means of salvation, Jesus says this in verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come unto the world 
Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Verse 20. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest their deeds should be exposed. Verse 21. But he who does truth comes to the light, and his deeds can be clean, clearly seen that they have been done, there were they have been done in God, the deeds. In our generation, right has become wrong, and wrong has become right. Turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Isaiah 5, verse 20. I'll read from the New King James this morning. Woe unto those, rather, woe to those who call good evil, or evil good, rather, and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Verse 21. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. The reason we see so much sin and evil is because people are in spiritual, spiritual darkness. But for some mysterious reason, we all want to live and be part of the world. That is the mystery of lawlessness. Jesus, however, says we are to live in the world, but not of the world. But when we let the world permeate in our lives, we don't know the difference between right and wrong. We sit in darkness. Uh, how about, how about TV versus Bible study? How much time do we spend watching TV versus how many times we, time we spark that we spend on Bible study? Today there is a need for a light. And did you know that the word light in the Bible has the distinction of being both a noun? The teachers in here will know this. Both a noun and a verb. We are not only to be the light, but we should also shine the light. And it's something that you choose something that I choose to allow God to do through us. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light and the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So shine, arise, and give God the glory. We need to bring knowledge of Christ to the world. We need to bring knowledge in Christ to our neighbors, to our friends, the people we work with, those who do not know him. Bring light to the world that gives in darkness. So how do we do that? By sharing how Jesus had brought light into our own world, and perhaps you have a way of shining a testimony for Jesus. You've heard it say before that there was a time in my life that the light shined to me. I was just a young lad and they wanted to amputate my foot, my left foot, and I said, no, mm -mm. Not going to do that. There's a team of doctors and nurses, and I'm laying in the bed, and they said, No, no, no. And I went home and we prayed to the Lord that He will do something for me. 
for three days and three nights, every 20 minutes, 24 hours a day, he soaked that ankle with hot water, compresses. The rest is the story. God took care of me. Perhaps that's one way we can witness for something that was done directly to us. To let the light shine to others. I remember someone once telling me that uh, when you go visit someone, use the fort method. Just trying to remember what it was. Family, talk about family. Talk about their occupation. Uh, and I forgot what the R was. And then the T was testimony. And we can give our testimony to our people by that method. And remember, make your way, make the way you live a reflection of the testimony that you give. According to Rick Warren, who is a noted theologian, there are two basic reasons people don't know Jesus, Christ Jesus, as their Lord and Savior. One way is they have met a Christian. And the second one is they have met a Christian. Ah. Oh. Our Christian influence is no small matter. There's another hymn in our Bible that goes like this. It comes in mind. Not I by Christ be honored, loved, and exalted. Not I by Christ be seen and known and heard. Not I by Christ. In every word and action, not I, but Christ in every thought and word. The song suggests this. We are becoming a reflection of Jesus. We are coming a reflection of Jesus Christ. Not I, but Christ. What does it really mean to reflect Christ, though? There was an article in the Newsweek titled The Fall of the Dinosaurs and explored the potential downfall of corporate giants such as General Motors, IBM, and Sears. But tucked away in the opening remarks were these words. The institution of family, the institution of church, and government had since lost their luster. Is it true? Three out of three most everywhere you look right? I don't know. Whether the, the diminished luster of the church is received or real, an illustration of Russian scientists may contain the answer. On February 4th, 1993, officials at the Flight Control Center in Moscow, reported a success, successful deployment of a space reflector. And this disk this, this was uh, used by the cosmonauts in the space station mirror to reflect light from the sun to the dark side of the Earth. With a disk, 25-foot disk, in space, they were able to produce two mile circle of light on Earth. Two mile circle. Such a move placed Russia in the foremost forefront of his reflection technology. Howbeit, they later acknowledged that the f that the f the effect seen on Earth was not the brilliance of the midday but rather more like the night of a full moon. So you don't need the suntan lotion for that. But was the church, but has the church lost its luster? If it has, it may be due to the feeble attempts to produce light rather than reflect the light. And how much greater would it be 
our impact if we started being better mirrors of the sun. S-O-N. Jesus. That's what it's about. Reflecting the light. Jesus is the light. There's a book, Heavenly Places, page 281, says this. The Lord requires his people to reflect the light of God's character, God's love, as Christ reflected it. As we look upon Jesus, all our lives will be aglow with the wondrous light. Every part of us is to be light. When whichever we may turn, light will be reflected from us to others. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. In him is no darkness at all. Therefore, if we are in Christ, there will be no darkness in us. But it seems that this world is so big and there are so many people, how can we shed light to everyone? A boy went to the zoo and saw his zebras. Everybody been to the zoos? Anybody been to the Philadelphia Zoo? We've been to the zoo. Yeah. You see the lions, you see the zebras, you see bears, you see elephants. And then this young boy saw the zookeeper. And like young most kids, children, they have been, they have to ask a question. He asked the zookeeper, how does anyone eat elephants? And unsure of the child's intent, the zookeeper provided only one possible answer. One bite at a time. How do you take the light to such a big world that has been blinded by the prince of darkness, Satan? You do it by one bite at a time. Jesus. Jesus, while, he's, while he here said he must be about his father's business. He was to reflect the love of the father through his life. We here have the similar calling. To reflect the love of his father. To reflect the light. To bear witness to Christ, the light. And to be the light. In this dark world. I would ask you this morning. On a scale of one to ten. Where do you fit? In that scale of one to ten. Of reflecting the light of Christ. Let's pray. Father we. We ask, Lord, that we can be the reflector of your light. We ask, Father, that we can be witnesses to this world and be reflector of Christ's light. I ask, Father, that we can be a light in our community. We can be the light in our family. For Jesus is coming soon. And we want to see others. We want to see others in the kingdom. Our family, our friends, the people we deal with in business. Father, we ask that you will, that you will bless us as we shine that light, that we'll be working boldly for you. And we will do it one bite at a time. For you can make it possible for us to do the work that you've given to us to shine for you.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.